welcome to this uh, Google Hangout breakout session uh, from the conference. Um, I'm obviously not Ben Brogan. Uh, he's been unavoidably uh, detained. I'm Jeremy Warner. I'm associate editor of the Daily Telegraph and a columnist on the newspaper. Um, with us uh, today, um, we have um, uh, a wonderful panel to discuss uh, a, a fascinating and intriguing uh, um, presentation that Lord Saatchi has just given. Uh, called um, uh, The Road From Serfdom. And if I can just briefly introduce the people who are physically in the room with us, because we also have some people who will connect with us remotely. There is Lord Saatchi to my left here, my immediate left. Uh, in Britain, he really needs no introduction, but uh, for our global audience, uh, Lord Saatchi is the co-founder of the iconic advertising brand Saatchi and Saatchi, and the man behind Mrs. Thatcher's um, Labour Isn't Working advertising campaign. And today he is, uh, uh, among many other things, um, a thinker, a philosopher, generally good guy all round. Um, further to my left, uh, we have um, Professor Deirdre McCloskey, um, who is Professor of Economics, History, English, and Communications at the University of Illinois. Chicago, and her website describes her as um, uh, a libertarian, quantitative, postmodern, free market, progressive, Episcopalian, Midwestern woman from Boston who was once a man, not a conservative, but a Christian libertarian. So, wow. <laughs> And Neil Ferguson, who also really needs no introduction, a uh, brilliant historian, author of The Ascent uh, of Money, and he is, of course, a professor of history at Harvard uh, University. So could we begin, um, uh, can I just uh, also briefly introduce um, our remote uh, panel? Um, we have um, Chantal Cody, and these are representatives of the small business sector in Britain, by the way. Chantelle Cody, who's co-founder of Rococo Chocolates, which, as its name implies, is a luxury brand of chocolates. We have Guy Miles, who's chief executive of Octopus Investments, uh, which specializes in S investing in SMEs. And we have um, Andy Greener. Uh, from Komodo Digital, which is a web design business based up, interestingly, in Newcastle, which is a quite depressed region of the UK up in uh, the northeast of the country. Could I just uh, briefly ask you, Lord <coughs> Saatchi, um, to, uh, for those of you who have not had the benefit of hearing what he's already said, briefly to introduce what your proposals for a more libertarian future um, for this country and beyond are. Yes, I, I suppose the, the, the simplest way to put it is that the, the CPS carried out uh, a poll and it asked people whether um, how much they trusted big government and we expected the answer to be that they didn't trust big government much. This is why socialism rather fell out of favour in, in Britain. Um, but we went on to ask them how much they trusted big companies and to our very great surprise and distress, we, the, the findings which were absolutely clear were that British people distrust big companies at exactly the same rate as they distrust big government. This for us was a particularly distressing finding as the Centre for Policy Studies was founded to establish um, or to promote Mrs. Thatcher's concepts of the free market and free market capitalism. And therefore we were concerned if it was true that the public had worked out or perceived or thought that what had been the result of globalization and global competition was in fact the creation of cartels uh, in the company of which they felt powerless. So we decided to, this was not in line with Mrs. Thatcher's thinking at all and that what we at the CPS needed to do was to develop a policy which would do what the CPS was supposed to do, which is to give people more of a, uh, an ability to be master of their own destiny. Certainly to be free of big government and big companies. And that's what this policy that we've announced today is, is about. And, and just to flesh that out, your, your <clears throat> proposal 
is to abolish corporation tax for small businesses effectively and, and uh, capital gains tax for small businesses. Yes, the, pol the policy is very simply explained. It's in two parts. There are two abolitions of tax. There is no tinkering with um, tax reliefs or allowances. Two taxes for small companies are um, abolished. One is corporation tax and the other is um, capital gains tax for investors in small companies. It's worth saying, I think, that small companies are recognized in UK tax law as different entities from other kinds of companies. They are known by uh, the revenue as um, the inland revenue, that's the, that's the UK tax authorities, as small companies and treated in a different way in terms of tax law and regulation. Uh, the definition of a small company in UK law is less than 50 employees. So this, this, these abolitions deal with companies which have less than 50 employees. That happens to be 90% of all UK companies because, um, certainly to my astonishment, the average size of a company in Britain is five employees. So 90% of all, of all companies in Britain would um, see their corporation tax uh, abolished and the investors in those companies would see their capital gains tax abolished. The, do you want me to tell you the cost? Which we come back yes. to? Yes. No, no, let's have the cost. The cost is um, £11 billion. Pounds. And according to the calculations by distinguished CPS economists who are in the room, the, the Treasury recovers that money very fast because what they have done is to follow the track of what actually happens to that £11 billion. Pounds. I don't think this has been done before. I've never seen a study which attempts to do that. So they, they've taken the advice, and William Norton, who's here, and Tim, the director of the CPS, will explain more if needed. They, they've taken the advice to, uh, of Deep Throat in Watergate, which was, <laughs> follow the money. And they followed the £11 billion. Pounds, and they've asked um, from the OBR models, where does this money go? Who has it? What do they do with it? Does it, yeah. people put it under their pillow, or what happens? And they found that, helpfully, the Treasury has recently published a document which explains what happens to that money after tax is reduced, corporation tax is reduced. And it goes, shall I just say, it goes in three directions. Um, it goes in more dividends to the owners of the company. It goes in more employ employees who are employed by the company. And it goes in um, investment, in capital expenditure or whatever. That's what happens to 11 billion pounds. And as you can quickly see, that those three routes produce for the Treasury a very large amount of tax revenue in terms of income tax on dividends, um, removal of unemployment benefit to unemployed people, replaced by income tax paid by employed people, and all that follows from the economic growth that comes from investment. So I don't think anyone's ever followed the money before, and following the money produces a result which is faster deficit reduction in the OBR model than is, is planned by the OBR at the, at the moment. Quite counterintuitive, quite remarkable, but also yeah. the reason why the um, CPS is um, full of brilliant people. Neil, could I bring you in at this stage? Um, I mean, is it right that big companies are now um, as big a threat to capitalism as big government. Do you think that that, that, that is um, a, a good way of looking at, at many of the problems in, with modern cap capitalism, the free market today? Well, I'm very sympathetic to Morris's argument, uh, particularly the, the fundamental argument that tax reform uh, is the, the policy lever that we need to use more if we're to achieve the kind of supply side uh, success that we saw back in the 1980s and the economics profession on both sides of the Atlantic has generally reverted to Keynesianism in a panic uh, and a kind of hyper monetarism that says it's really all down to monetary policy um, and aggregate demand so I think there's a fundamentally important intellectual thrust here which is to make us think again about the supply side and not think that everything boils down to what the central bank does next to make uh, interest rates even even lower. I love the road from serfdom as a title for obvious reasons. And I think there are two ways in which to answer your question directly, this approach uh, is right. There, there's crony capitalism, 
which I think is a, a distinct phenomenon. That's when companies are so close to government, are directly involved in uh, producing what are in effect public goods, that an unhealthy relationship develops. Uh, and you can encounter crony capitalism all over the world. Uh, during the Asian crisis, we kidded ourselves that it was only in Asia, but actually it turns out to be alive and well in the English-speaking world. And then there's the, the sort of more uh, general phenomenon of, of cartelization, which Morris has talked about, where you get excessive concentration uh, in particular market sectors, and the, there's collusion between these few big players. And I think one reason that so many people in the opinion poll that we're talking about took a negative view of big business is their understanding of the financial crisis, uh, and in particular the relationship that was suddenly laid bare between government and too big to fail banks that got bailed out uh, with uh, the, with taxpayers' uh, resources. I think that's probably uh, greatly increased the suspicion of big business relative to say 10 years ago before the financial crisis. I, I mean, I think the, the, the vantage point here that's important is the vantage point of the small businessman. And unlike most academics who pontificate about economics, uh, I actually am a small businessman too. Uh, I've started and run three companies in my time. One failed, one does okay, and one is doing well. And from my vantage point, anything that helps me uh, reinvest in the company, uh, hire more employees is attractive. But the reality is, whether you're in the UK or the US, uh, where I now live, the reality is that if you're a small business, in all kinds of ways, uh, the dice are loaded <coughs> against you. And, and not just in terms of tax. I think it's important to add in this conversation, in terms of regulation, the disproportion, a disproportionate burden falls on the small player and the big guys who can afford to have compliance departments can navigate their way through extraordinarily complex mm -hmm. regulation. So let's not forget this policy, which Boris calls the policy, really ought to be only one of a number of policies designed to make life easier for small businesses. Final point, it's the small businesses that generate the jobs. That is very easy to show. And uh, to expect pure demand side economics to generate employment when we're doing so much wrong on the supply side, so much to hurt the small businesses that create jobs is just nuts. So I welcome this policy and uh, dream, I suppose, that it might be considered by HM Treasury, which generally doesn't look with great fondness on proposals to cut tax. I, I mean, Deirdre, what, do you think it's right to um, differentiate between small and big companies in this way. I mean, not all big companies are bad. Google is not a bad company, for no, instance. I don't think so. And 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 fast-growing companies aspire to be big companies one day. So this proposal might actually bizarrely disincentivize that transition, that important transition economically, uh, for companies from being small companies into big companies. Well, you, you know, I, I, I think you can show. Hist, um, historically, now and over the past couple of centuries, that the very large companies compete more and more with each other because they compete internationally. And from the point of view of the individual consumer looking out from her house, she has more and more companies, the country store, and then Sears, uh, Roebuck, and then Amazon, competing for her uh, custom. So I, I'm not sure it's true that the big companies don't compete, but it is the case that the big governments do not compete, and that if you're in a large country with a large and powerful government, you're a serf. We shouldn't assume that the uh, that the that the man on the street being polled knows who his enemies are. He often gets it wrong. There's a um, there's a per se suspicion of largeness of all kinds. 
but of course I would be very much in 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 favor of of Morris's proposal, if only because it's the thin edge of the wedge, to abolish the corporate income tax entirely. Look, from the point of view of economics, no one knows who pays the corporate income tax, and most particularly in this, we don't know for large companies. For small companies, it's very plausible, particularly if they're closely held corporations, uh, not publicly tr traded, that the incidence falls on the, well, the owners of the company. But that's not true for large corporations. It could be that the people who in effect pay the corporate income tax are the customers of this large corporation or its suppliers or its employees. And for half a century, economists have been trying to figure out who pays the corporate income tax, and we haven't, we haven't got so, an answer. Yes, I mean, Lord Sarchi, what about that? I mean, why this further tinkering around the edges of the corporate tax system? Like, why not just get rid of corporation tax altogether, which, as Deirdre has just explained, is, is subject to international tax arbitrage, avoidance, and so on? And if you want to, find other ways of taxing business. Why not? Why not go don't, whole hog? Don't, don't tax. Don't tax business, business at all. That way, <laughs> but but Can don't on the tax hand? business I'm because you don't know who pays. That's no. the problem. I mean, you one could abolish all taxes. That, that, that you can <laughs> say. Good idea. Like, <laughs> I'm the, for the, it. The, the the reason that the reason that the CPS has lighted on this particular policy is because the, um, the this policy comes from a philosophical background. This, this doesn't come out of thin air. This is, in fact, a social policy which was brought into effect by economic means more than, a, more than an economic policy. Because what the Centre for Policy Studies is for is for independence, individuality, self-determination. I am the master of my destiny. That's what we, we interpret as our brief from Mrs. Thatcher. That's what she wanted. So the, the reason not to cut every possible tax that there is and to concentrate on this is that this is the way for a man or woman to be able to say, I am not dependent on big government or, as they now feel, dependent on big companies. I want to be the master of my own destiny, the captain of my ship. So this policy doesn't, this policy doesn't come out of thin air. It comes out of a, a philosophical base, which is the true basis of um, the CPS, Mrs. Thatcher, and in our opinion, of course, the true basis of conservatism. But that will be up to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer to decide. Um, could we um, now uh, bring in our remote panellists? Um, and perhaps we could start with um, Andy Greener, who's uh, the Chief Executive for Komodo uh, Digital. Um, Andy, is this, um, and you'll have to <coughs> make a slight delay. In Andy, is, is this a, a good idea? It, will it significantly uh, benefit you? And do you, would you feel less of a surf if this was implemented? Um, yeah, I think effectively it's it's a, it's a good idea because I think taking taking politics um, out of um, investment, which effectively uh, corporation tax is paying paying the treasury uh, out of your profit, um, and then the political entity that's in charge at the time will then reinvest or spend that money as it sees fit. Um, Speaking personally, I think I think um, businesses, particularly entrepreneurial small businesses, are probably instinctively better placed as to where that money should go. Um, and I think most small companies would say uh, that would be investments in people, uh, plants, capital equipment, um, advertising, making themselves bigger than they were. So yeah. And are there other taxes that um, uh, you think um, would could, in a fair way, be tilted in some way towards the small business sector? <laughs> I think picking up on the earlier point that um, this this probably needs to be a, part of a series of uh, initiatives um, and I think you could look at each each tax, particularly kind of VAT, um, employers national insurance contributions is another one. I think that's a kind of a, a disincentive to, to employ people, it's a tax on jobs. Yeah, they could all be looked at on a on a case by case basis, um, and I think uh, yeah, it's been generally more supportive of smaller firms um, that do occupy such a large 
a large and important part of the economy, um, yeah, it should be looked at. Could we bring in uh, Chantel uh, now? I mean, is um, Chantel is tax one of the big things behind entrepreneurialism, or do people just want to be entrepreneurs and kind of get on with it, regardless of whatever tax breaks they're being given? What do you think? Um, I would say, from my own point of view, as Lord Sarchi said, it's all about being master of my own destiny, and that's why 31 years ago I just. that time under um, Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister it was not a very um, easy environment in which to set up a business. Um, I think probably one of the major taxes which no one's mentioned is, is VAT and that's gone up in my time of doing business from 15% to 20% and I'm sure the 11 billion is dwarfed by the amount of revenues that it are actually generated by businesses and consumers paying this 20% um, tax. Yeah. Um, Guy uh, Miles, who's chief executive of um, uh, Octopus, um, is, this, uh, is this the sort of tax break that you're looking for, or is th are there other things that can be done in the system? And um, uh, VAT, I mean, in the US, as some of our, our viewers today will be from the US, of course, they don't have a federal sales tax. Is that a, is that a significant disincentive, particularly to small businesses? Um, well, can I just firstly say I read the report and I thought it was an absolutely marvelous report, fantastically well written and argued. And um, uh, speaking personally, I don't want to sort of bring my company into a political argument, but I'm I uh, completely and uh, wholeheartedly agree with the uh, conclusions and uh, the method that was used. I would pick a bone on one part, which was the abolition of VCT and EIS, because I think that uh, to do that we're slightly comparing apples with pears, because corporation tax is paid by successful, fast-growing businesses, and VCT and EIS are there, in my view, to help attract investment into very early stage companies. I mean, I am quite biased about that because we invested using uh, VCT into a whole series of companies, including Zoopla, which floated today. Well, we invested a few years ago at about 1 90th of its valuation today. So uh, VCTs have, in that context have been very good. Um, my own experience, I set my business up when I was 26 years old with two friends, and they were both younger than me. And we found it extremely difficult, and it took us years to build the business that we have today. And when we started getting profitable, we had so many investment opportunities for the company. But uh, at that time, about a quarter of our profit was taken away in the form of corporation tax. And I found that incredibly frustrating. And I knew um, intuitively, and just using my own eyes, what a terrible use of our national resources that was. Because if the money had stayed in my business, I would have created more jobs and faster growth and more taxation. So it was very inefficient. Um, uh, so I, I mean, I completely agree, and, I, and I'm completely convinced by uh, the argument in the report that it would lead to significantly higher rates of tax long term. To answer your question about what else I think is distortive, it has nothing to do with my company and the businesses that I invest in, but I think business rates is a significant problem and one that I've seen with my own eyes. If you look at the high street, I think it's now very distorted by the um, relatively high rates of business rates compared to uh, um, uh, deductions or the avoidance of it you can have if you're a charitable business or a social business. So you see now a proliferation of one type of business over another, and I think that's a classic case of tax distortion and it's wrong. Thank you very much. Now, look, we've, we've got um, six minutes left, so uh, hopefully um, we can have a little bit of audience participation here. So we've got some hands up already. Perhaps I could go to you first in the second row, if you could briefly introduce yourself. Uh, Matthew Sinclair, um, various organizations over the years. I'm, I'm really disappointed that the CPS is so naively equating market share with market power, which depends entirely on barriers to entry. I'm really alarmed that the CPS is 
giving up the Lawsonian tradition in tax reform, which was about trying to make tax as neutral as possible between different forms of corporate organization. And I haven't seen any case here remotely persuasive that says we should give up. I mean, leave aside the more radical ideas, which I have a lot of sympathy for about getting rid of corporation tax and replacing it entirely, with a simple policy saying cut corporation tax to 10% instead of you trying to use it as a weapon with, to, in order to try and enforce this one view of what corporate organizations should be. And missing, as Jeremy says, the simple point that the, the companies that really create jobs aren't small businesses or large businesses, they're small businesses that are growing and want to become large businesses. And if you choke off the incentive, if you choke off the desire to be that large business, you will not help competition. And I, I really do not find this remotely a persuasive policy, let alone the policy. Well, that was... <laughs> You better take um, that one. <laughs> I'm not, are you saying then that you think that small companies wouldn't want to grow to be big companies? I'm saying you'll, say you'll, you'll set a ceiling on their, their ambition. Oh, I see. You'll, like, yes, a, you, you will, you'll undermine the proper... You'll, you're trying to decide what the right form of corporate exit organization is uh, using the tax system. You're trying to use a tax system instead of competition policy, which is an incredibly simplistic and ugly way to interfere in the market. And the last thing a Thatcherite organization should be endorsing. So you're not a Thatcherite. <laughs> On the point about the incentive to grow, I think, I think if I've understood properly, what you're saying is that if, the, if this um, tax freedom applies to companies up to 50 employees, then you've got no incentive to have 51 employees. Therefore, you've no incentive to become a big company. Is that what you're saying? You weakened it. All right. So the yes, the answer to that point, which is in which is in the um, document, is that uh, the, the, there are two taxes that are being abolished here. One is corporation tax, and the other is capital gains tax for investors in small companies. And um, yes, you could argue that if I if I stay at a size of 49, I won't pay tax, and if I become if, if I become if I have 51 employees, then I will start paying tax at that level. But um, the answer to that is that the investors in these companies, who are very much like the, the um, three guests we've just had, they have a tremendous incentive to go forward and build their company up to the biggest size they can get to, which is that when they come to sell their shares in the big company that they've built, they're going to pay no capital gains tax. I mean, th that, that is a mind-bogglingly attractive advantage to anybody who's trying to build a business. So. I don't take the point at all, Jeremy, that right. there is a disincentive because the because this is for small companies of only 50. You don't want to have 5,000 employees. You certainly do because when you sell the company, you're going to make a serious fortune on which you're going to pay no tax at all. You see? Yeah, I do. Yes, um, gentleman in the first row. Um, Roger Kendrick, and for these purposes, Rockpool, which is another business that invests through EIS. Um, I, it, just two points of structure I'd like to make. The first one is that all job creation in this country is from companies that employ less than 50 people. And I think that reinforces what we're trying to do, what you're suggesting. Um, the second thing is that when we industrialized in this country, it resulted in economies of scale, and that resulted in big business. But the internet has changed that. And I think we need to recognize that the interest has the internet has given us a huge opportunity to create smaller businesses. Now, to ask the government to give up on um, corporation tax and capital gains tax is a big ask, but there is there are a couple of preference, uh, uh, precedents out there. The first one is the £2,000 national insurance um, credit that every company gets. So rather than say to the government, look, you've got to abandon corporation tax on small businesses, why not just say you get a £10,000 a year tax credit? and then make it 20,000, and then 30,000, and bit by bit, you could have a, a, a real benefit for smaller companies by going through that route. Um, and there is another precedent, too, with, with microbreweries. Microbreweries don't pay the same level of um, alcohol duty. And there we've seen a great industry developing against the big companies. Yes. Who would like to take that? Yeah, I... I I, I, that idea of a, of a substantial tax deduction against small business income, I think, it is wise. It, it has the same, the same, the same purpose. But there is the problem of the non-incorporated small uh, 
companies. And under that scheme, they too would find themselves absolved of tax for a while until they became large. Um, Neil, just to wind up, um, just pick you up on a point you made earlier. Is it not really banks and finance that we're really worried about in terms of the threat of big corporations uh, to um, modern day free markets and capitalism? Isn't isn't that what fundamentally underlies it all, this concern? This is a, a complex question. I, I was alluding to the public perception. Uh, the reality, of course, is somewhat different. Uh, one, one can't say that having a very concentrated banking system with a relatively few banks is per se a bad thing. It didn't turn out to be a problem in Canada. Uh, so the, the real reasons why these big banks became a source of trouble, not least for taxpayers, had to do with the way that they were managed and the excessive leverage on their balance sheets. Uh, so that's quite a complex technical question and a pretty good example of a question the man in the street might not have a good handle on. The other important point about financial services is that although there are some very big players uh, and uh, concentration in the UK is significantly higher than in uh, some other countries. Uh, it's not clear that there's not competition. And we, we should remember that just the concentration of a sector is not uh, the same as, uh, as, as the, as it were, lack of, of competition. Uh, in, in that sense, I'm sympathetic with the most critical uh, Questioner, we have to be we have to be careful here. Uh, there are all sorts of methods, not least at the European level, uh, designed uh, to ensure that there is competition. And successive commissioners, I think, particularly of Nelly Cruz, were pretty effective uh, in the European uh, pursuit of anti-competitive practices. I think we therefore need to recognise that. Uh, that the perception that makes the public hostile to big business is based uh, probably on a somewhat simplified version of the financial crisis. In an ideal world, I agree with Deirdre, uh, one wouldn't want to have a corporate income or corporation tax at all. And I must say my support for this measure is precisely uh, that it would lead ultimately to that destination. Uh, I'm not sure that you'll ever sell uh, outright abolition to any treasury in the world might sell significant across the board reduction, but the political benefits of emphasizing the interests of small enterprises are not to be underestimated. And I think we have to remember that the Center for Policy Studies is not just some kind of gang of wonkish uh, macroeconomists. It was always intended to be about creating political foundations for free market economics and building coalitions of voters that would be supportive uh, of a pro-market party. And that's the beauty of any policy that emphasizes benefits to small business. There are a lot of votes in that strategy. And although I may sound a trifle cynical in saying this, that's the point. Well, it remains to me just to um, thank our panel, both physically here in the room and remotely for participating in this uh, Google Hangout. We wandered over some big macro issues as well as some micro issues on taxation policy. Um, brilliant discussion, really fascinating. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeremy.